This conference will now be recorded. Right, thank you very much for that introduction, Ian. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here to present um, on behalf of the East West Rail Phase 2 project. Um, we're going to be talking today about the design and construction of the track formation. Um, there will be, as as uh, Ian said earlier, we're looking at getting some other presentations in the coming years. So I'll just do a quick couple of introductions. So I'm Tim Mead. Um, I've worked for about 30 years on the railway. Um, I've been with Network Rail um, for about 20 years, and I've spent the last 10 years working in projects. And I've worked on a number of projects on Western, and the latest project I'm working on is Phase 2 of the East West Rail project. So I work within the East West Rail Alliance and I work within the engineering assurance team. I have two hats on. Um, the most important hat is the Alliance Lead Discipline Engineer track. Um, and then the other hat I have to wear is the designated project engineer. Um, I'd like to introduce my colleague from the Alliance, Hannah Carey, and I'll let Hannah uh, say a few words about herself. Thank okay. you, Tim. Yes, uh, my name is Hannah Carey. I work currently within the Alliance um, as part of the site design team as one of the contractors responsible engineer for the track bed design on the project. Um, I come from a geotechnical background myself and I spent a number of years working on track bed designs and two of which are the detailed design of the East West Rail Phase 2 project. I also lead um, as a sub-discipline lead the track bed design discipline back within Atkins um, as my parent company. Thank you very much, Hannah. Right, I'm I'm going to take you through very briefly the uh, the East West Rail program itself, um, and then Hannah's going to then dive into some detail about the design and talk about some of the issues for construction. And I'm going to wrap the presentation up with a discussion on qu um, construction quality assurance. Okay. Yeah, I mean, one or two IT issues, of course. Right. Sorry about that. So I hope everybody is reasonably familiar with the program itself. Um, there's a few bullet points on the slide there as, rem as a reminder, but essentially it's about reopening the rail line between Oxford and Cambridge. So number of phases. Um, phase one has already been delivered, which is which is the upgrade between Oxford and Bicester that allows the uh, Chiltern service to run from Oxford to Marylebone. Phase two and the bit the Alliance is working on is reopening Bicester to Bletchley. So, as I mentioned earlier, it's an alliance um, and it's a method, method that we're working, working through to deliver the project. And there are four partners within the Alliance. So we have Atkins who are leading on the design and they're leading on the signaling power and telecom systems. We've got Lang O'Rourke that's leading on the civil engineering construction. We've got Volker Rail who are leading on the track construction. And then, of course, you've got Network Rail as the client within the alliance. OK. So I've mentioned it's an alliance and, and I'm not going to discuss too much um, how the alliance works. But because we are working with the alliance, we are looking at new ways of working. And we have some principles I put up on the screen here that we work to. But the two on the bottom left are the two principles that I'd like you to bear in mind because these are quite key to the way that we are looking to deliver the track bed. So the most important thing is value for money. But probably what is key for us within the alliance is making sure we have the best person for the job regardless of who they work for. OK, so I want you just to keep those two principles in mind because that's quite an important theme. OK. So a little bit about the project. Um, there's a little bit of a diagram through there and then there's some high level numbers to the right for you. Um, I'm not going to run through the numbers. Uh, it should say that there is a huge amount of work to be done. The project itself is actually split into four sections. We've got section 2A, 2B, 2C, as you can see there on the screen. With the fourth section is the little bit between 2A and 2B that's got that little blue little blue area, which is the HS2 integration area. 
So within this area, the bridges, the earthworks, the drainage and the track formation is being delivered by the HS2 project because this is where their corridor crosses our corridor. Okay. Now I'm going to tempt fate now and I'd like to show you a little bit more detail about the, uh, the, the actually the infrastructure we're building and hopefully I won't mess the IT up. Okay. So I'm hoping on your screens you should see a little diagram and it should be in enough detail for you to start to make out a little level of detail of the project itself. So if I move my cursor over here, this is what we call phase one. This was the upgrade Oxford to Bicester. Um, Bicester Town is now Bicester Village. It's handy for Bicester Village shopping. And as part of phase one, just underneath my, above my little cursor was the cord to connect to the Chilterns main line. So that is the part of the route that's been completed and trains are now running from Oxford to Marleybone. We then go straight on at Gavray Junction, as probably the best description, and we pick up the old line um, that, that went through to Bletchley. The bit in the middle 2B section in here was mothballed, 2A was operational as a freight only. So in the middle here, um, we have provision for a connection to the route to Aylesbury. Now that's not, a, not something that's being delivered by the Alliance, but we have provision to put that connection in here couple of freight loops and we have connection to the HS2 infrastructure maintenance depot. We then have a new station at Winslow. Um, for those of you who uh, may know where the old station are, we have not rebuilt Winslow station exactly on its old footprint. It's been moved to a new location. And we then come up over the viaduct over the West Coast main line. We've got two high level platforms at Bletchley. And then we are upgrading what I call the sneaky back way into Bletchley. I'm sure there's a better description that leads to Denby Hall South Junction on the West Coast Main Line. And just off, off the edge here is Milton Keynes Central. Um, not part of the Alliance um, scope for delivery is looking at getting from Bletchley slash Milton Keynes to Bedford. Um, there is a connection that we reinstate that allows you to join the Marston Vale lines from Bletchley here leading to Bedford off the edge, edge of the paper. So that's just a quick high level view of the project for you. So if I get this right, I should go back to the presentation. That's been a success. So we've actually started some of the track works. Um, we've done some work at Vista just to uh, extend the stub end to allow engineering trains to be brought in. And I put some uh, some basic details there about what the track is going to be. Um, one thing to note, it's a category two line with a hundred mile an hour line speed. Now the formation, brand new formation, the design and the delivery was part of the earthworks and drainage package. So, package. so it's being done by our civil engineering colleagues, not being delivered by the track team. So again, we're thinking about the best way of delivering this. There are lots of other civil engineering works. That slide just shows there's plenty of bridges and all sorts of other things. And this is a view of the new high level platforms at Bletchley, which are sort of towards the top and towards the right. You will see um, those new platforms there. Um, I'll just hover the mouse over just to give you an idea, as you can see there. And then we've got the connection through here to the existing station, okay. New station at Winslow, two platforms, twin track, footbridge, station building. There's also a car park um, that is for Bucks Council that we're building, and that's off to the right of the picture. Just quickly on the program, so at present, all of the civil engineering is all go, so that's earthworks, track formation, drainage, bridge repairs, that's all go, but we are starting literally a couple of weeks ago with track relaying at the Bletchley end and then the track relaying program follows the civil engineering program finishing up with taking the earthworks from the HS2 project and putting the track on and 2023 we'll see the signaling and the power and the con systems go in and then we are looking to have all of our infrastructure ready in May 2024. Project organization little complicated big project but essentially we have a design team and then we have a construction team um, and what you'll see is we have um, 
construction teams for sections A, B and C, and they're doing the big heavy civil engineering. And then we have system-wide teams to do the track installation and, uh, and also to do the signaling power and comms. So I just want to talk about a concept we have during design, which is to do with high and normal risk. So this is about how um, in a project, the engineering deliverables, design deliverables in this case, are accepted by network rail. So we have agreed that packages are classified as high or normal risk. And this is a joint discussion between everyone in the team. And essentially, anything that's classified as high risk comes to the network rail project engineer for acceptance. And they are termed the Alliance Lead Discipline Engineers. Um, and anything classified as normal risk, the design team has a role to accept on behalf of Network Rail. We have various other general high level reviews in place, but that's the philosophy we use. Okay. So if you just excuse me, I've just got a ah, box in the way, I can't see what I'm saying. So for the track formation, the approach we took is the first package was defined as high risk that allowed us to, to check that we had the right philosophy, the methodology was agreed, and then we applied that to the other packages. All right, I just had a night, light pause. So what I'd like to do now is hand over to Hannah Carey, who's gonna talk a little bit more about uh, the formation design and construction. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Tim. So as I mentioned at the start, I'm currently working within the Alliance as part of the site design team as the contractor's responsible engineer for the track bed, um, having previously worked on the detailed design of this track bed and I myself have a geotechnical background. So I'm going to focus the presentation on the design methodology that we follow for track bed design um, and how we've incorporated that into East West Rail, touching on some of the construction aspects. Um, but first of all, I was going to start slightly higher level. And if we move to the next slide, with what actually the track bed is. So the track bed are the layers below the sleeper that support the horizontal and vertical alignment of track. And there's three distinct layers with their own functions. So the capping layer at the base is generally there for the overall stiffness of the track bed when the underlying ground is not as strong as we would need it to be. Blanketing layer is there to provide a drainage feature within the track bed. And it also acts as a filter to prevent any fine particles migrating upwards to the surface. The ballast is there to dissipate the loading from the base of the sleeper to these engineered fill, fill layers and support the horizontal and vertical alignment. Now, typically the blanketing layer is a sand layer. On this East West Rail Phase 2 project, because we have um, the temporary hall road incorporated into the permanent track bed design, with the permanent track bed making up the base of this, we couldn't use sand and we've got a type one filter layer instead. But if we move to the next slide, why is it so important to focus so heavily on the track bed design itself? Um, there's many reasons, not only because of its key role in supporting the permanent way throughout the route, but it's also there to dissipate the railway loading to the underlying strata, whether that's the natural ground or the man-made layers as part of the embankment. And if it's done well, um, we can ultimately reduce the number of maintenance interventions that are required throughout the lifetime of the assets. And if it's done with a full understanding of the ground, its behaviour and how this varies throughout the route, we can ultimately reduce some of the track bed thicknesses as well. And a small saving in the track bed thickness over several kilometres of the route can have a huge impact on the sustainability of the project as a whole. So if we move on to the next slide, just covering the four main things that we look at when we start to consider the track bed design. So the first is the stiffness. This is the stiffness we need to provide as part of the track bed to support the railway. Um, and also the stiffness of the underlying ground. So network rail track bed design standards state what stiffness we need to meet based on the category of the track, the line speed, whether it's a green field or a brown field site. We then look at the drainage, um, whether the track bed can be fully drained throughout the life because that will affect its performance. So we look at the groundwater level, any potential for erosion of the subgrade, and any potential for the pump for pumping to occur and fines to migrate to the surface, causing wetbeds. 
We then look at any deep-seated issues that we can't necessarily solve with trap bed design itself, but may later impact that. Typically, that's a long-term creep of an embankment. Um, and then we work with the earthworks teams to resolve that. And finally, we look at any potential differential settlement along the route. So these are areas where the track support is suddenly changing, typically on an embankment approach to a shallow underbridge, where you go from the engineered fill layers onto a shallow concrete deck, deck with ballast supporting it. And we consider these throughout the main stages of the actual track bed design, which if we move to the next slide, I've covered the stages that we use in track bed design. So first of all, we always start with the death study. Um, and if we have an existing line, as we have partially on East West Rail Phase 2 and the non moth mold sections, we collate any track quality data that we have already. We put that together with the topography we've gathered, any underlying geology and the proposed route to scope a trap bed investigation, which I'll come on to in more detail in the next couple of slides. And then we use all of that information together to undertake our technical design, which is actually the, just the starting point because we then look at any practical engineering solutions that will improve that initial design, whether we can reinforce the track bed, whether there's existing granular material that we can incorporate into the design, and that produces our final track bed solution, which on a large civil multidisciplinary project such as East West Rail, we then interface with the other design disciplines to produce the final solution. So in the next couple of slides, I'll just go through these sections in slightly more detail starting first with after we've done the death study our track bed investigation so if we move to the next slide on east west rail phase two the track bed investigation was primarily conducted using trial pits automatic ballast samples and the transport research laboratory dynamic comb pentrometer this gives us an understanding of the ground ground strata as it varies throughout uh, with depth it allows us to take samples away for laboratory testing. It allows us also to access and do some in situ testing. For example, on a cohesive or clay formation, we'll undertake some hand shear vein tests to get an understanding of the undrained shear strength. On a granular formation, we'll also do, as I said, the probing um, to give us an indication of the current stiffness of the ground in the area where we're going to propose the track bed. Me moving on then to the next slide, we'll take away our samples that we've collected and we'll analyze this to give us a better understanding of the ground so that typically forms classification tests which on granular material will do something called a particle size distribution which tells us how much fine material is currently present in the granular layers on a cohesive or clay formation we'll do atterberg limit tests which will give us the liquid limit the plastic limit and an estimate for its current strength but it'll also tell us the shrink swell potential of that ground and we'll put that together with the in-situ tests that we took outside with the probing and the hand the shear strength um, to evaluate the ground throughout the entire route um, and see how that varies as we travel along the, the route. So moving to the next section, we put all that together, sorry, moving to the next slide, sorry. We put all that together on what is known as a summary sheet or a longitudinal section. And this is actually, a network rail deliverable requirement for the design um, where we plot not only the ground investigation data but we plot the proposed track alignment the current ground level with all of our death study data as well and ultimately we include the design solution on the very first line on that ribbon as an example from east west rail um, and this forms the basis of the information that we use to take the design uh, to undertake the design but it also then forms the document out on site for where we're specifying certain design solutions. Typically, on other projects, this is generally drawn by hand, um, but on East West Rail, because we have such a large route, we've slightly digitized this process and made it more semi-automatic, which if we move on to the next slide, we've got our ground uh, death study data stored in a separate database. And then we use text to image scripts to populate this in a civil 3D model. And then we use our digital data from the ground investigation contractors. So there is now a requirement for all ground investigation, track bed investigation data to be transferred through digital format known as AGS formats. And we keep that in a separate database. And then we use scripts again to format how we want this to 
um, be displayed and we populate it at the same geographic location in our model to produce the longitudinal sections and ultimately the result in a PDF form doesn't look too dissimilar to us if, if you had drawn it by hand however it's a lot faster to produce we're actually reporting the information in the same accuracy that's being recorded in out on site and we can incorporate changes such as areas being descoped or additional investigation quite easily and quickly into our design solutions so then moving on to the next slide once we have all of this information collated we can actually start to undertake our design and i've just pulled out an extract from the network rail standard for trackbed design um, because it underpins quite nicely. We need to know what the dynamic sleeper support stiffness that we need to produce for this track bed is, which is, as I mentioned, dependent on the track category, its speed, and whether we have a greenfield or brownfield site. We use our understanding of the ground, um, its stiffness and its strength to produce to know what values we anticipate throughout the route, and we produce a certain number of solutions that will then be used. We then look at how we can edit these solutions by increasing adding reinforcement or we provide filtration in the form of geotextiles as well and if we move on to the next slide i've just got an example of the seven treatments that we propose throughout east west rail so these are different uh, different designs different depths that are applicable for different ground conditions throughout the route um, and then on the next slide, once we've got those design solutions, we've got them allocated depending on the ground conditions, we look at in detail certain areas in more depth. So beyond just the required dynamic sleeper support stiffness that we need at certain areas, um, we calculate the track modulus in, in areas where we anticipate there to be a sudden differential change, as I mentioned, for example, shallow underbridges. Um, using that track modulus, we then calculate the deflections we anticipate on the embankment and the de deflections we anticipate on the bridge itself. And we slowly increase the stiffness of the track bed on approach to these areas so that we don't have a sudden change in stiffness, because ultimately these are areas where we know there is frequent maintenance required if it's not done and well transitioned, and it can affect the um, and the track system itself and fail the track system so moving on to the next slide i've just got an example of one of our transitions um, and as we have no direct fasten track on east west rail we have no structural elements i.e we don't have a concrete slab buried underneath the ballast we have simply just a geotechnical solution which is increasing the granular depth and increasing the reinforcement we've provided in these layers on the approach to these structures and then moving on to the next slide, in previous projects, this is typically what we provide to the contractors. We provide the longitudinal summary sheet with all of our bases for the reasons behind our design, the allocation of this design throughout the route, a cross section of what these design solutions look like, and a table showing the build up of the different track bed solutions. But on East West Rail Phase 2, we've taken the visualization of this data a few steps further. Um, moving on to the next slide, I've got an extract where we've actually uh, an extract of our 3d model so right throughout the entire route we've produced a 3d model which is a significant advancement from the standard cross sections because it allows us to more clearly show how we anticipate the track bed to vary as we change the crossfall for example from a twin crossfall with a crown in the center um, draining either side to a single cess drain or a six foot drain and once we have this, it's also allowed us to interface the designs more appropriately. So moving on to the next slide, where we've got an example of the 3D model um, in a more complicated area where we have clearly showing the track bed connecting to assessed drainage system on one side, draining over the edge of an embankment on the other. We've ensured that we have enough space for the ancillary civils team to provide a cable troughing route, that we have um, not enough space on one side to install an acoustic barrier and therefore the earthworks teams have proposed a retaining wall and it allows us to make sure that these designs are all connected together. I will also cut, um, because we then have this 3D model, we can also produce a surface file for each layer of the track bed, whether that's the base of the ballast, the base of the formation. And moving on to the next slide, that is then used by the contractors out on site and uploaded straight into their GPS controlled machinery. So out on site, the operator can view the surface in his cab. The bucket is set to the crossfall that we required. And in those tricky areas where we're changing crossfall, 
the surface shows exactly how it should look out on site. And I think this is one of the benefits of working within the Alliance on this project, because we have had the involvement of the contractors at the early stage of the construction, uh, early stage of the design, influencing best practice on that design phase. And then we have designers present during the construction phase, ensuring that the what is being constructed out on site in trials is as per the design and that we are going to achieve our values. So moving on to the next slide, that's really what my current role on the project is at the moment, which is the site design team. I'm there answering any technical queries that arise throughout the construction, anything that's varied compared to what we assumed, and also checking, checking that the construction is actually being done in the appropriate way. For example, the typical issues that you encounter on trapper projects um, is the right use of plant. So we should have a smaller plant for the base of that formation. Typically, we have softer ground, and then we need the right roller and compaction equipment to ensure we're achieving the compaction in the track bed layers that we're laying. Fundamentally as well that we're laying that material in the right moisture quant moisture content. So if it is too wet, we won't get the com right compactive effort. If it's too dry, it won't bind together, we won't get the right compactive effort and we won't achieve the stiffness that's required of these layers. And thirdly, to ensure that while it's being constructed and particularly important during the winter periods, that we are managing the temporary water out on site so that we have a method for the track bed to be draining during the construction, during its temporary phase. We're not exposing large sections of the formation that may be um, damaged due to the weather or the rain. And then moving on to the next slide, once we've assured that we are constructing it, which we are in ESOFL phase two, um, in this method, we are then testing the performance of this track bed. Um, and this is quite important, as I mentioned at the beginning, that we're using the permanent track bed layers as part of the temporary hall road. So once the permanent track bed is complete, we are testing it with a lightweight deflectometer, which will give us the dynamic modulus of that track bed, which is in the new track design standard, the required value for a new track bed of 45 MPa. Um, and then we are retesting this after the temporary hall road aspects have been used and taken away to ensure that when the ballast is laid, we are still complying with the requirements that the track bed needs to meet. But I'll hand back to Tim, who's going to talk a little bit more about some of the construction assurance processes on the project itself. Hi, Hannah. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about construction assurance. Um, and then we can then go to some questions. You're muted. Sorry about that. I seem to have been muted. Um, so uh, just to just to recap on this slide. So we want to obviously we want to demonstrate that the product the product has been built to the required standard and quality. But I'm going to draw upon the themes that I mentioned earlier about getting value for money and using the best person for the job. Sorry, I seem to have a problem every time I advance the screen. I mute myself. So, um, so the philosophy we're in, employing is we use progressive assurance for the build. So this allows us to address the issues early on, and most importantly, the assurance processes are for the benefit of everyone in the alliance and not just for the benefit of the client. Okay, and the most important part of the philosophy is is that we are looking for self-assurance but the delivery teams need to provide a supporting evidence trail okay based upon this we need to understand the risk profile and then we then build an engineering assurance process that is based upon the risk profile so this is the team there's quite a lot of lines of information in here um, i'm not going to go through it line by line but at the top we have Buckingham's and Murphy's, who are our earthworks contractors, and they are, as I said on the previous slide, they're responsible for self-assurance and demonstrating um, the evidence to support that. 
We then have a number of layers, and what you will see is most of these layers are by other teams within the alliance. Okay, and we provide levels of assurance. So we have got uh, things like, as Hannah mentioned, the site design team and the role that Hannah is playing. Um, you also have the role that I play at times as well as the Alliance Lead Discipline Engineer track. And most importantly as well, you have the track construction team as part of the assurance process. So if I move on to the next slide, we've got a number of tools. So the most important one is the appointment of competent staff. So we appoint competent staff and we also like to make sure that these staff are at the right level. So a lot of the staff that have been appointed are actually from Buckingham's and Murphy's, okay, into these roles. The main tool is the inspection and test plan, and that provides important evidence to support what we have built. We have photos, test results. Within the inspection and test plan, we have a number of witness, hold and approval points. Basically, a witness point is uh, something that we offer for somebody to look at. A hold point is where we stop work until somebody turns up and has a look at something. And an approval point is where it needs to be approved before people carry on. And we build that at various levels within the assurance process. And there's a predefined levels. OK, most of witness hold points and approval points are dealt with internally within the alliance. We also have internal handover to the track team. So it's not just a question of saying, well, it's all built, crack on and we'll lay some ballast. We do expect deliverables to be produced. We do expect test results to be produced. So that gives the track team confidence that they're building on a good formation. Most importantly, both our two Earthworks contractors have undertaken site trials. We do this quite a lot on the Alliance. It's an opportunity for us to learn learn how, how effective we are in delivering things, correct issues, and obviously revisit the program so we've got a robust way of delivery. And of course, we have internal and external audits as well. So I just want to summarize our approach to construction assurance. It's based upon the risk to, achieving the to not achieving quality, and that's where we're focusing our efforts. We're looking to empower the right person to take responsibility for the for quality. And we're looking to make sure that this is as close to delivery as possible. And we're not looking with an assurance system of man marking people or checking the checker. It's more audit and review. And most importantly, we do have documented processes within the Alliance of how we achieve construction assurance. Um, and we follow these. So. I just want to wrap up and say that we have successfully delivered and handed over to the track team our first section of earthworks. So this is in the Bletchley area. So um, what we have is where my little cursor is to the top. Uh, that leads on to the flyover. Uh, this is the line that leads to the connection to the Marston Vale line. So these are the Marston Vale lines diving underneath here. So Bletchley station is literally around the corner and Bedford over here. And then this is the track um, over the bridge. I hope you can see my cursor that leads down to Denby Hall South Junction. And um, for those who uh, will be asking the question, when does the track construction start on this particular section? We actually started a couple of weeks ago um, and the track construction will now be um, carrying on and heading westwards towards Vista. So, um, just like to finish the uh, presentation and thank everybody for your time um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much to you both. Um, I'll start, I've got a number of questions so far that have come through. Um, the first one, Jan, uh, what will happen to EWR's programme if HS2 is delayed and subsequently delays HS2 civils works in the four kilometre corridor? Um, we have a problem. Um, there is a there is a work stream looking at what would happen if that if that um, that did did go ahead. Um, but uh, I think it, we have 
I hope it's uh, it's not delayed, but we have looked at various options to mitigate any delays, and there's a people are looking at that right now. Uh, the next one is from Paul Gray. Are there any areas of flooding risk, and if so, uh, how have you designed for a for to best mitigate? Um, there are quite a few areas that are that are subject to flood risk. Um, there's been a work stream that has been done by the project looking at flood modelling and flood risk, um, and there's a number of areas where we've built in uh, flood mitigation measures. Um, there are a small number of sites where, given the constraints we have, we haven't been able to totally mitigate the flood risk, and we've looked at obviously um, the uh, one in a hundred year flood and um, the impact of global warming. So we've got most of those sites fairly well mitigated. Right, uh, Liam Jackson, uh, will all of this really valuable digital track bed investigation information and 3D formation models be handed over to the asset owner maintainer? We yes. Are, <laughs> we are planning to do that. Uh, <laughs> yes, we are not using <laughs> this information. Um, no. We're, uh, we're updating the design model with the as -built that will then be handed over as part of the project, but also the investigation data um, is part of the British Geological Society, um, Society's Dig to Share project. So it's uploaded as part, of, as part of the contractual requirement of the project, uploaded to that data source to be available for others as well. And it's typically becoming more and more common on um, infrastructure, national infrastructure projects. Okay, uh, Peter Halliwell, uh, I would like to know about the specifications for the new railway and passive provisions, uh, permissible speed track category, train service specifications, axle weights, gauge clearance, etc. Ah, right. Uh, now, I probably ought to find, uh, let me just scroll through the chat and find things. Um, so, Let's just talk about some of the um, some of the passive 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 provisions that's been made. Where we have been doing uh, bridge reconstruction, um, and where we have been and at the stations, we have actually been catering for future OLE, um, but that has not been applied to all structures. There has some structures been left in situ. Um, now we've had all of the level crossings on the, new, the section we're building closed and we have an agreed soffit height to the bridges um, that we've worked through, did a work stream to work out what the minimum soffit height should be. Um, so talking about permissible speeds, so the, the line speed that we're designing for is 75 over 100 mile an hour HST. Um, there we When we get over Bletchley flyover, we can't achieve that speed. Um, and we have actually dropped the speed down to 40 mile an hour. And whilst we're not upgrading um, Denby Hall South, there were some serious challenges to get 40 mile an hour out of that junction. We have made provision to upgrade. Um, the plane line we built has been designed for um, 40 mile an hour. We've also made provision to upgrade the track on the little spur that leads to the uh, Marston Vale lines. Um, track category, um, we've done quite a lot of work looking at a variety of uh, train services, um, not just the service that it will be, be starting for the Oxford Milton Keynes service. We've looked at including future services in there um, and we've made a, an allowance for freight with the track category. Um, train service specification, um, let me just make sure I get this right. It's two trains per hour is what we have, what's called a number of configuration states that, that um, I, I won't go into too much detail about, but is like East West Rail Company's aspirations for services. So the, the current one that we're planning for is two trains per hour and that's Oxford to Milton Keynes uh, and I think if I remember correctly that's going to be a three car DMU. Um, in terms of axle weights um, the infrastructure um, is all designed for RA, 
R810. However, where we have sections of the track that have speeds over 75 mile an hour, I think that drops to RA8. Uh, and the final thing on gauge clearance, um, there's a lot of work gone into, into the gauge clearance. We are we are very lucky that because it, it's all new build, um, I can't see any problems with gauge clearance for future rolling stock. Um, so we're not in some of the projects squeezing the infrastructure in and doing detailed um, assessments for the stock to prove it just it just it just squeezes past our infrastructure. So I think on the gauge clearance. Uh, you name it, it should fit that we currently know about, with the exception probably of a regional Eurostar. Um, <laughs> I hope that has answered all of your questions, Peter. Um, I've got a question from Sam Allwood. Uh, what was the rationale behind using NR56 S&C as opposed to NR60 Mark II, considering you're installing SEN60 plane line? Um, yes, the current network rail standard and I stress current network rail standard that we work to during the um, we've worked to during the design um, requires us to use NR56 and that's down to the uh, the length of the SNC so all of the SNC is all going to be 40 mile an hour on the turnout route and they're going to be uh, F switches uh, I can't off the top of my head remember the crossing angle but it's it's all it's all 40 mile an hour so if you see what the standard requires you to do um, then the standard points you towards NR56. Um, I'm hoping next year we can talk a little bit about the double junction which is NR60. Uh, Peter Halliwell again, how does the decision making based on for the project consider the long-term implication of decisions made in operating and maintaining the railway throughout its life cycle? Um, that has come through by um, generally led by making sure we meet um, standards. We do have a number of requirements um, that have come from the asset owners that lead us towards um, their aspirations for future maintainability. Um, so it's really the requirements is where we're picking up on um, some of the longer term longer term issues. Um, just to give you an example, uh, a track example, this this was a requirement that um, that we had, but there was a um, various requirements on if we were raising speed over existing sections of track. So um, for example, when we raise the speed on when we raise the speed between Bletchley High Level and Denby Hall South on the plane line, um, we did an assessment and the agreed scope was that the track was not fit for raising from 25 to 40 um, and therefore we introduced a renewal in there. Um, there was a requirement, previous requirement, looking at uh, tonnage increases and use of existing rail. So there's a number of requirements in there that address future maintainability. Um, question from Simon Day. Does the project provide a draft inspection and maintenance plan that is incorporated into the timetable ahead of handover? There is uh, operations and maintenance strategy. Um, there is a work stream that the Alliance has fed into. Uh, we've worked with some of the delivery units, but there is a work stream of actually building the engineering access statement um, that's being led that is not necessarily led by the project um, but we do feed in information about what the um, the assets asset, assets are um, but yes there is a work stream on that. Um, question from Neil El, El, El Samont, uh, has Network Rail considered how it can receive the digital trackbed model to realise the benefits that it, that it can offer? It's great that the information is to be handed over but it could be of limited value if NR cannot store it accessibly. Um, all I can say on, on this one, there are um, discussions with, with some of the people in the asset information um, part of Network Rail. Uh, the, our intention is, is to hand over the digital model, um, but obviously Network Rail needs to keep the model and no, 
rather than uh, rather than lose the model and it needs to be maintained. Uh, a question from Paul Gray. Tim, I think you mentioned using an HS2, HST differential permissible speed, DPS. Can I ask why that was chosen compared to MU? We have recently done a piece of work at RSSB on criteria for DPSs and it would be good to contact you afterwards on how that relates to what you are working. Hang on, I can't uh, see the last bit, too. Working to, yes. Um, the decision to actually go for an HST differential speed rather than uh, one of the, the MU differential speeds, that, that was some time before I joined the project. I think what the driver for that was the fact that we have on phase one, we have, um, they used a differential uh, HST T speed um, and that was primarily driven by the Chiltern Railways 2 plus 6. I am aware um, I am aware of the RSSB um, project that's ongoing and, and there are some there are some issues to um, that we need to delve into as an industry to understand about these differential speeds. Um, I'm afraid that's about all I can I can I can answer on that one, but I'd be happy to pick something up with Paul later anyway. I think I may be wrong, but some time ago, I think there was a possibility of a of the reintroducing the South Coast to Manchester service. Uh, and that was going to come up to Oxford and come across to, onto the West Coast. Yes, that was. Um, and therefore that could have been at that stage. That was, it could have been yeah there was that was some time ago in development there was a um there was talk about cross country using this on a regular basis um i'm just trying to think off the top of my head what what the 220s 221s run to differential speed wise i can't i can't off the top of my head uh, remember that one i think when i was working on some timetabling information for tonnage but this we were we had got one or two services that were shown on the list yes at that yes. time at, at that time you're correct kevin there were there were uh, there were cross country sh services shown yes uh question from peter again uh in designing the track bed what features have been encountered which have challenged design and construction limits how have the solutions for these features been resolved um do you want to start on that one, Hannah? Uh, sure. Uh, there was quite a number, actually. Um, one of the main first ones was trying to incorporate the hall road into the track bed. Uh, it's not typically done, but it saves having a hall road the entire length and dramatically increasing the land take for the project. But um, it did pose challenges in terms of st uh, the filtration and the drainage of it. We also have a number of um, shallow services throughout the route some of which have been diverted others not so we've had to look at um, protecting those and then protecting the track bed from i.e. I. concrete slabs etc in the route um, in the section i think tim mentioned the flood modeling that's been done there's certain areas where we have very shallow lying lying, lying ground and the drainage is not quite um, fully deep enough so we've had to look at some ground improvement solutions below the track bed um, digging out some of the clay to provide more storage capacity. Um, there's, there's, those are the sort of main ones I can think of um, that we've I'll had. Just, to... I'll just pick up on, on the hall road. When I first saw it, of course, I stuck my head in the ha my hands and thought that's the last thing I want is somebody running over my four, four <laughs> mega, uh, you know, even with 150 mil of additional material on the top. Um, there's been quite a significant challenge. So as Hannah said, originally we had hall roads either side of the trace, but there's been a significant challenge on both cost and environmental grounds here. Um, so that's why we've gone towards using this combined formation and hall road. Um, yeah, you know, the environmental damage of us installing a temporary road alongside a railway line is huge you know uh, we've had to think about about not you know 
doing such a huge environmental impact. I mean, even things as simple for us as wanting basically to to remove all of the vegetation and, and start from bare ground and work build upwards has been challenged. So, you know, those are the challenges that happen during design. I think the, the biggest construction, construction challenge we're having at present is probably the weather. Um, you know, we're at the mercy of the weather. Um, one of the things I think a lot of people will be observing these days is is that we tend to have a lot of very sudden heavy downpours and that has given us quite a challenge with you know with a lot of water hitting our works in a very short time um, so some weeks depending on the weather we have some quite some impressive rates of a build and then the then the next week couple of bad days with the weather and, and production rates drop to half the value. Have there been any challenge, well, per question from myself, have there been any challenges uh, as a result of the old track bed? I um, there, many, unless you have uh, some, Hannah. There was a lot of them old ballast as, as being sort of removed, but um, it, the contamination was not as significant as you potentially would worry about, I think, from some of the old track beds. We're actually, a lot of the old ballast and old sand blanket and old granular layers is above where the proposed base is going to be. So we, when we strip it out, we're actually reusing it for the fill of the, uh, the earthworks, um, where we're ex widening some of the earthworks. Um, so it's actually been quite beneficial to have a source of um, good granular material in certain areas of the project, which we can use elsewhere. Um, but most of it was not, particularly in the mothboard section, it's it, a lot of the ballast has been well, well worn down by the time we're here. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I'll hand back to uh, Ian now. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I was really interested in some really good questions as well. Could I um, could I please hand over to Peter Halliwell to do the uh, vote of thanks, please? Thank you, Ian. Thanks. Um, good, good afternoon, Tim and Hannah. Thank you very much for giving your time today and sharing uh, everything that you have with us about the design works for um, phase two of East West Rail. I think we've, we've seen over the last 15 years that um, alliances have been very successful ways of delivering major projects. And it's, it's always good to see how those alliances are fitting together and meeting the challenges that arise to, to produce uh, big railway works. And, and in this case, major re-engineering and a reinstatement. Um, thank you very much for taking us through some of the details in the, the technical parts of producing good track bed design. Thank you very much for responding to the various questions, including my challenging questions on integration. It's always interesting to see how those things are being considered. Um, and you've took, taken all of the questions that were put to you in your stride. There's some uh, excellent material supporting the presentation, both in terms of diagrams and photographs. And I think everyone will agree with me that it's a, um, a very worthwhile um, hour or so that we've spent learning about the work on East West Rail. So could I ask everybody to join me and show our appreciation for your presentation today? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. And um, I'd just like to add my thank you. My my personal thanks to Hannah. Um, she's done a lot of very hard work to support us on this project. Um, Hannah is sitting her professional review tomorrow, and I'd like to wish her all the best, <laughs> particularly seeing she's taken time out the day before to help with the presentation. So thank you very much, Hannah, and um, all the best for tomorrow. <laughs> thank you, Tim. Hannah, it'll stand you in good stead at your professional review when they um, yes. ask about your. Um, professional development good luck yep. thank, thank you very much everyone um, <laughs> if anybody does have any further questions if you if you send them through to kevin i will try and answer as many as i can do later <laughs> on and and um certainly certainly for paul i will try and we will try and be in contact about the uh, 
how can I put it, the murky world of differential speed restrictions at times. <laughs> We will be we will be sort of trying to uh, put the next uh, segment on EWR uh, in the September to uh, December session next year, uh, with a bit of luck at the moment. Um, that's still to be still to be sorted out, but that's when we're considering it at the moment. Yes, I, I, what I'd. Um... What I would like just to give people a little bit of taste of the sorts of things we'd like to present about. Um, to be honest, there's not much to talk about track design. I think the real interest is to look at the the huge logistical challenge of building a brand new railway. Um, so we'll be looking at a number of techniques. So we'll we'll be we are using the new uh, construction train. Um, we'll also be using bottom up construction. Um, so I'm in the I'm in the process of persuading Joe Jameson, who's my CRE track, that he needs to do this. Um, I'm sure we'll have something ready for you next year, Kevin. Um, Thank you. And I'm also trying with Joe to arrange a suitable time to come and see something interesting as well for, for the section. Thank you very much for the offer. That's no problem, Kevin. <clears throat> That's really great. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, on, on that note, I'll bring the meeting to an end. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone.